So welcome everybody uh, to today's exciting edition on our webinar on emerging topics in biomolecular magnetic resonance. Um, so please don't uh, record because we do record and uh, upon the speaker's consent, we also upload uh, all lectures to the ISMRBS uh, YouTube channel. Um, uh, so just to remind everybody uh, for your questions, please use the Q&A, not the chat box, or raise your hand. And uh, there's also this early career edition of the uh, webinar of ICMRBS, uh, which I encourage you to uh, listen to and participate. So then without further ado, uh, I want to introduce uh, the first speaker, uh, which is uh, Hei Yang Kim or Ann Kim. Um, from now Pfizer. And uh, so I know Hei Yang actually already many, many years. Uh, so Hei Yang uh, obtained a bachelor and a master's degree uh, from Yonsei University in Korea uh, in chemistry and biochemistry. Uh, and during her master's thesis, she already did uh, NMR studies on, on peptides. Uh, so after her uh, master's thesis, then she actually joined my group as a PhD student. Uh, and uh, did a fantastic uh, uh, PhD thesis on alpha synuclein, And uh, I guess some, one of the most uh, memorable things is really that she showed uh, that amyloid fibers of alpha synuclein are can be called denatured, uh, so that they can really be dissociated, which allows one to uh, obtain very high concentrations of highly uh, sort of aggregation prone toxic uh, alpha synuclein oligomers. And then she also further characterized uh, this uh, by NMR. And uh, I just have to say, or want to say, uh, that it was really excellent uh, to have uh, Hei Yang in the group all these years. And I just show here one picture, uh, which was a nice uh, Korean dinner. And uh, you can see on the left, of course, Christian and myself, and here Hei Yang and uh, her husband, Min Kyu. So it was really a, a memorable time there. And uh, so after that, uh, Hei Yang joined uh, then uh, first uh, Steve Feshik at uh, Vanderbilt University, uh, where she got into screening using NMR spectroscopy. And uh, from that, I guess that prepared her in an excellent manner then to join industry. First again, using screening, NMR and other techniques, I believe at Merck. And since a few years now, I don't know, two or three years, uh, you're now at Pfizer. Uh, as a, a group leader heading the uh, biophysical analytical chemistry unit. So thank you very much, Hayan, for agreeing to speak and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. And also now I remember that memorable dinner. <laughs> <laughs> right, so uh, good morning and good evening, good afternoon, everyone. And this is my uh, big pleasure to share the story that uh, what I'm, uh, what we are doing in the biopharmaceutical, especially in development area, and how NMR is utilizing, and then this method is uh, kind of emerging uh, method to here. So briefly say, okay, so. Uh, I, here's the outline that today's presentation. So basically, I would like to very briefly introduce about the what is Fi, uh, Pfizer Biotherapeutic Pharmaceutical Sciences. So acronym is BTX PharmSci. Then uh, how the NMR uh, is absolutely uh, used in the drug discovery and biologics development. And then one case study about incorporating NMR and chemometric analysis into the higher order structure characterization uh, in a BTX pharmacy organization. So, so uh, as you see the Pfizer, uh, there is a discovery and development, and then I am going to focusing on this the therapeutic, uh, biotherapeutic farm side. So the scope and responsibility is briefly uh, described in this uh, diagram. So basically, uh, we are uh, working on the bioprocess and then analytical and formulation and then device development. And then uh, all those uh, uh, more than uh, nine uh, plus R&D sites are pretty much working together. And then 
uh, we all involved uh, delivering the all biotherapeutic and vaccines at Pfizer. Just a moment. So next, the NMR spectroscopy is a pretty much very well defined method in the drug discovery. So the NMR is a pretty much a versatile uh, method. So it can be used many different aspects and many different things to uh, characterize. So I am going to focusing on introducing the biomolecular NMR and also especially some of the area of focus. And discovery and the development, I first wanted to make a clear concept that some people is using this one as a mixture, but then the discovery is basically from the target uh, validation and, and th through the uh, animal toxic study. And after that, first in humans through the phase clinical, uh, phase, phase, clinical trial phase one through the phase uh, phase three, and until the approval and launching the uh, product, and we all call this stage as drug development. So the biomolecular NMR uh, is, as um, we all very much know about this fragment screening as a screening tool, that this one can be a primary screening, and then a structure model that it can be uh, in terms of atomic level of information give that, so molecular mechanism of action and then design stuff. Then uh, structural biology, we call that area as in terms of residue level, that heat validation and the enzymatic assay and all the epitomapping. Then in development, we wanted to use that one into the uh, biologics part. And especially the, what I wanted to focus on today's presentation is about fingerprinting. So the higher order structure compatibility and similarity is uh, pretty much uh, uh, important. And also the uh, monoclonal antibody is represented as one of the largest category of the protein uh, on the market. So then in terms of the higher order structure, so as the diagram is showing that after the primary sequence, the secondary structure and tertiary structure and quaternary structure, all those structures, the secondary structure through the quaternary structure, we call it higher order structure. And that one is classified as a product quality attribute. And that product quality attribute is pretty much important and the biophysical characterization of all the results can be uh, breathing the structure and function. And then this one is directly related with the safety and efficacy of our uh, therapeutic proteins. So uh, there are several many of other molecules and modalities. Uh, currently, we are much more focusing on it. But today, we are going to talk about these monoclonal antibodies. And what is the current biophysical method? Uh, for the higher order structure assessment in terms of biotherapeutics. So it, those things are, we call the platform method and uh, the higher order structure and together with the um, uh, aggregation and uh, those, those kind of stuffs are pretty much important for the, our quality, uh, quality control and the, our analytical tool to develop. So, in terms of that, uh, every of these method is having the automated feature workflow. And then uh, these, pretty much those methods are very well established in the uh, uh, development area. But then um, as we see here of the summary plot, so NMR, especially the 1D proton is pretty much sensitive in terms of uh, uh, protein higher order structure of folding and the global information of the protein. And then uh, in terms of 2D, it gives us uh, even uh, local information. And this method is also pretty much uh, giving us a lot of uh, uh, benefits for the sensitivity and then specificity. But then, uh, as I mentioned, NMR is pretty much well uh, used in discovery area, but in development, uh, we call this method as emerging method because this is uh, still not yet very well validated and not yet uh, uh, qualified. So I will also go through through the slide that uh, what kind of effort uh, we are adding 
uh, to establish those kind of methods into the development stage. So the one thing that I wanted to quickly mention is Pfizer uh, development. We also purchased and installed 800 and 600 cryo in 2019. And then uh, we are gonna expand more of the NMR capability in this year and next year. So then why NMR? It's totally clear for our NMR field and NMR friends, right? So as we see, that is the highest resolution among the other bio, uh, physical technology the, for the higher order structure characterization in solution. And then it basically offers a fingerprint and similarity approaches. And then uh, NMR, obviously it can really uh, apply for the many different uh, function of the development area. So like formulation study and biomanufacturing and then quality control and biosimilarity. So what we wanted to do is we really, really wanted to apply the NMR in the biotherapeutic farm site uh, organization. And then we first wanted to identify the area and how this uh, NMR characterization approach can uh, contribute for this method. So there are many of area we found that and then uh, it is a little difficult always project support and the method development going together and then method development can be easily forget so we basically build up the nmr task forces and then colleague can have a commitment on this method development and eventually what we wanted to do is we really directly contribute this robust characterization packages uh, to enhance uh, we call BLA, biological license applications uh, provider and also optimize our manufacturing uh, success. So as I mentioned today, we are gonna focusing on the higher order structure uh, spectral compatibility method and how NMR can be used and this one can be uh, useful for, for, for us. So here is a, a two paper I would like to highlight. So one is from MGen, and then the other one is from the NIST and the other regulatory and academia lab, more than 50 uh, NMR labs are working together. So basically the very first paper is about uh, NMR fingerprint uh, method. And then this one is utilizing the 1D proton NMR. And then uh, there is the way to uh, analyze the uh, monoclonal antibodies fingerprint, then comparing them how robust this method and then how sensitive this method to show the monoclonal antibody compatibility and the similarity. And then the other one is the since um, monoclonal antibody is more than 150 kilodalton, which is huge, and the intact monoclonal antibody, we cannot really use the proton nitrogen HSQC, uh, which is gold standard for the protein uh, monitoring. But then in this case, we use for the uh, methyl fingerprint. So basically those each methyl fingerprint is representing about the uh, uh, higher order structure of the secondary tertiary and quaternary of this protein. So basically it shows that the NMR is pretty much robust and then it can show uh, those, those, those differences or similarities or compatibilities in a way of uh, a high, high sensitive way. So it's pretty much straightforward when we see it's 1D proton and also 2D uh, methyl HMQC experiment. So we successfully able to get the uh, NMR data and then the NMR data is pretty much uh, giving us all the compatibility and different batches are pretty similar. And also uh, we are pretty much confident that the older data quality is fairly good. Then it seems like, okay, or is that? And it's pretty uh, easy and robust. But then we got the many of the questions that how accurately this spectral compatibility measured by uh, visual inspection. And also what kind of metrics can be reported should uh, show those compatibility. And then what type of statistic analysis uh, are capable to measuring uh, these spectral similarities. Then uh, is this 1D NMR should be efficient or sufficient and or 2D is always required. So everything should go together. So those kind of questions are raised. And then uh, we wanted to set up and in, uh, implementing. So method itself is pretty straightforward, but then we really need to understand what the requirement uh, to put it into those kind of filings and so on. 
So before I move forward, I wanted to make a very brief uh, uh, definition of uh, uh, quality attribute and comparability and biosimilarity. So we are using those uh, terminologies in terms of a different way, but then in terms of biopharmaceutical, we do have uh, um, clear differences. So the quality attribute, we are calling that one as a molecular or product characteristic that is selected uh, for its ability to help indicate the quality of this product. So as I mentioned, the higher order structure, it does consider it as a product quality attribute. And then uh, once we need to determine what is a critical quality attribute, and those things is need to be determined through the project team's discussions and, and etc. So in terms of compatibility, we use this terminology. Uh, once the manufacturers make those kind of improvement for the process changes, then we also need to uh, show there is no difference of uh, pre-changes and post-changes of those batches. Then this one goes to the uh, compatibility uh, assessment. And then biosimilarity, it means uh, we do have a biological product, which is highly, highly similar to the reference, which is originated product. Then we also need to show that there is no clinically meaningful differences between those uh, biological product and the reference product. Then in, in terms of the safety, purity and potency, uh, then those things we are calling the biosimilarity uh, assessment. So. Then um, we, we are uh, bringing this animal method to the development in the farm side organization. We first need to show the, the, the uh, method, of, method of suitability. So which means the robustness of this uh, animal method, the experimental parameters and protein concentration and volume. And the, even uh, we are need to specify that what type of animal tubes we are using. And then uh, for the specificity, we do uh, utilize the denatured monoclonal antibody versus the native monoclonal antibody. And then those things can be done, then it, we, can, we, can put, we can go to the next step as a platform method qualification. So those platforms uh, need to be repeated with the specific molecules. Up to now, we tested the three different monoclonal antibody in many different various conditions. But then we are continued to explore the, the other uh, monoclonal antibodies and bispecific and tri-specific and how those things can be applied for um, uh, this NMR method. After that, uh, we wanted to go with the assessment of this uh, verification part, which is um, we basically wanted to uh, have some guidance about pre-acceptance criteria. So what is similar and what is not similar? And those kind of guidance is also need to be um, addressed. So that's why that's the thing that we now are looking for the collaborations with academia or regulatory and all those kind of discussions is ongoing. So the experiment uh, was a very well uh, collected and the data analysis part also uh, pretty much straightforward. But in this case, what we need to do is we also uh, need to make some kind of SOI, which is standard operating instruction for the NMR uh, based higher order structure spectral compatibility. So in this case, there are uh, each of the steps we need to specify and also we need to make it clear for the non-expert NMR people in the, uh, in the group because uh, uh, we are in the biophysical group and then there are um, many of different diverse and two or three NMR experts there, then we need to make sure things can be followed by non-expert NMR people uh, easy enough, robust enough and clear enough. So I wanted to highlight from this uh, workflow about two things. So in terms of uh, uh, system suitability, I believe when I was in academia or when I was in discovery, we really didn't do this the system suitability part before we collect any animal data. But then here, uh, we need to do it to make sure before we collect any, uh, any data that what we wanted to see. So we basically, uh, utilize the Azure system suitability, which is automated broker system that runs the test for the uh, sucrose and chloroform and ethyl benzene and make sure um, all the NMR system and the proton line shape, line shape and sensitivity, things are consistent. And then there is no other concerns is coming from the system. 
So that's why we make sure that our data collecting is pretty much consistent. And, and then uh, for the protein, we also utilize for the ubiquitin as a standard sample, then test for the 1D proton and 2D proton nitrogen and 2D uh, carbon proton uh, for to make sure all the sensitivity and the line shape, everything is consistent. So we are not getting fooled by those kind of line broadening is coming from any kind of shimmying or, 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 or et cetera. The next thing is about then data acquisition. So uh, at the moment we are putting as a standard experiment as a R so fast HMQC uh, for the monochloro antibody methyl to the experiment. But currently we also uh, get the one another PERS program which is called XL R so fast HMQC. So that one is under investigation. Uh, in terms of 1D proton experiment, as we know, there are many of different versions and then we use that one for what we need every time and different molecules or different purpose. But in this case, this SOI is specially dedicated for the monochloral antibody. So we basically uh, tested all different versions which can give a best, base, uh, best baseline and best way of phase correction and also what is giving us uh, best best information for us, then uh, we actually selected uh, what MGen uh, proposed about pulse field gradient uh, uh, stimulated echo, which can filter the, all the uh, small excipient peaks, and then we can get the large protein uh, signals uh, beautifully. So up to now, that is the, uh, 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 the, the thing is uh, how we collect NMR data and the workflow we set it up. Then the next step is, um, what type of uh, data analysis, uh, how we can implement to, to this uh, SOI workflow. So we also uh, studied a lot and explored a lot different of way software. Uh, when we are doing that, we found uh, MBIO HOS plugin, which is giving us the NMR chemometric analysis. And then basically they provided a PCA and also CCSD, which is chemical shift different deviation, and then ECHOS and the profile. So basically all things are pretty uh, straightforward and putting all the data and then uh, process, then we can get the final result. But we really need to understand what's going on there as, as, as a, a, a in charge of uh, NMR related work. So basically uh, we tested each of the single uh, parameters and also each of the single uh, uh, method using the, our in-house uh, proteins. So the protein fingerprinting by uh, line shape enhancement, uh, this experiment is pretty much uh, straightforward. Basically, we can get the uh, fingerprint spectra from the uh, substract of the Gaussian broadened uh, contour spectrum from the uh, first blood gradient STE uh, 1D proton experiment. Then uh, it can also uh, compare with the uh, reference, which is the, our originators, and then uh, the other uh, biosimilars as we called a test. The reference and test, they are in a similar uh, median and it can show they are pretty much similar. And if this one is out of the median, then we can say that those are not similar each other. So as you see, these are a pretty uh, straightforward. And then the easy compatibility HOS, which called ECHOS. Uh, this one is also a pairwise intensity cross correlation of these two spectra. And then one to one intensity comparison, and we can determine the R value through the linear regression. And the, um, we also need to know what is the uh, similar and what is not similar and all those kind of things. So basically here I show very simple uh, 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 metrics here, but we basically tested all the different um, TD, the time domain, and also the scan number and the temperature, and then different types of monochloral antibodies. Then we try to uh, set it up the acceptance criteria. So which means um, uh, what is the highly similar, what is just similar, and what is uh, questionable, and then not similar at all. So all those kind of activity is still ongoing with the Pfizer statistician. And then we wanted to establish those acceptance criteria for this spectral similarity. Uh, and then uh, very briefly about this PCA part. So adalimumab is one of the monochloral antibody and then we are having EU and US under these different temperatures. 
then uh, of course this black one is a denatured adult map and as visually we can see that one is pretty much different with others. And then uh, we also can see the temperature differences of these um, uh, two, uh, two molecules and PCA obviously clustered very well at the high temperature and low temperature and then the different differentiate them with denatured adalimumab. So these things are also pretty much clear to giving us all oh, the PCA analysis is also giving uh, the visual inspection is giving an information about the qualitative way but then this one can give us some of the uh, quantitative way of this analysis on, on our uh, monoclonal antibody uh, spectral similarity. And then um, we also can bring in the Mahalanovis uh, distance measurement. So in this one, maybe we can uh, briefly mention that basically uh, we can get the distance from center of the cluster, then measure those distance of the size and shape of the clusters, and we can see how, how far they are. Then when we see the 310K, they are pretty tight. But then once it is higher temperature, it goes a little bit more, but then comparing to others, those are still pretty much close each other. But from this one, what we were able to read out is um, uh, the 310 is a favorable temperature for us to keep measuring the uh, all other similarities, not the uh, higher than the 310, because the 323 is really close to the, our thermal denaturation conditions. So just one another thing about the optimization of these PCA parameters. So um, there are more than 360 combinations is possible to find out what is the best one, uh, best parameters for, uh, for the PCA analysis. So, so far, those green highlighted parameters is the one that we found. Um, up, uh, so Victor, one of the, our group member, he basically tried more than 90 combinations. And then uh, he basically come up with the, those green highlighted as the best uh, parameters so far. So this is the all things that what we uh, tested and then how we developed the things. Then we wanted to apply uh, this 1D and 2D NMR chemometric method. This one is really sensitive enough to detect any changes of this uh, stability study because uh, we wanted to show they are really identical, they are really similar, but we also wanted to see and apply those methods for the uh, stability study characterization as well. So in terms of uh, uh, experimental plan, so this is the way that we are designing the pH and thermally stressed material for NMR. So the, we basically choose the adalimumab and then uh, trastuzumab, two different monoclonal antibody. But then uh, all those things we can just uh, skip. And then uh, eventually what we wanted to do is we wanted to collect the um, high quality 1D and then high quality 2D Bethel NMR data and then analyzing them with the chemometric analysis. So why we choose those two is um, basically adalimumab and then trastuzumab, we had a, a, a CDR hotspot analysis by LCMS. And the adalimumab basically showed that there is not so much of the degradation uh, percentage. But then the trastuzumab, it really showed there is um, much of a and also isomerization as do you see this red uh, uh, highlighted color. So uh, as we expected, uh, in terms of adalimumab, it didn't really show any changes even in NMR spectrum in the 1D and 2D. Uh, the interesting stuff is that um, proton 1D spectra of this trastuzumab, when we see them, so no stress, which means uh, control, and then different pH under the pH stress, and then the thermal stress, they do show that pH, uh, intensity changes and also it does show a little bit of chemical shift changes as well. So in based on uh, this, we also can analyze this PCA for the 1D proton NMR spectra. Then they basically cluster them uh, very nicely. And the interesting thing is that uh, we found the pH 4.5 in terms of the degradation pathway and mechanistically this one is going a different way comparing with the pH 7.5 and pH 5.8. So we can also see that uh, this PCA is pretty much very well uh, clustered, uh, those kind of differences. So basically uh, we, can, we, can, uh, we can see uh, this prof uh, 
I didn't show the profile data here, but then profile and PCA analysis is able to show NMR chemometric methods are sensitive enough to detect those changes and uh, stability study. And I also wanted to emphasize here that this is a continued investigation to establish the method as a platform method. So uh, it's not a final stage yet. So we are continuing to uh, explore with the different types of the monocular antibody and different types of force degradation conditions. And then uh, we will, uh, the ultimate goal is we are gonna uh, set up this one as a platform method. So as a summary, um, as high field uh, uh, solution NMR is really a multiple multi-attribute technology and sensitive to the chemical environment and also provide the orthogonal information to the other biophysical method. And then uh, NMR absolutely is increasing and being utilizing in research and development at Pfizer. And then of course other uh, leading biopharmaceutical companies as well. And the uh, recent development, it allows high quality NMR data uh, of the unlabeled monoclonal antibody as intact, and then those effective chemometric analysis. Then uh, the Pfizer is actively developing and implementing this NMR capabilities for the higher order structural comparability and similarity assessment. Then we do have uh, NMR task force groups to investigate different biotherapeutic attributes and modalities. Then the internal uh, collaboration with the statistic and biophysics group and the mass group and the other NMR groups in Pfizer. Then we are also uh, proactively looking for the external discussions and also collaborations uh, with Brooker and Mestra Lab. And especially uh, we are gonna initiating the collaboration with NIST, uh, John Marinos group with Frank Dallasio. So we are pretty much looking forward to uh, what things we can deliver for this project. And and I would like to thank for the people in the group. Uh, of course, here is our uh, message spectrometer and biophysical characterization group. And then uh, the, especially I wanted to thanks to the NMR HOS compatibility task force team. And Victor uh, Belmont is the one that who is leading of this project. And also Lucy prepared a sample and Leon is the Pfizer statisticians. And then the Kelly is in charge of MSBC NMR. Then the uh, MSBC uh, and also biotherapeutic pharmacy ARD leadership team they are giving us full support for the NMR capability implementing in the development uh, area. And then uh, Brooker for Donna, she is uh, always in a timely manner to respond for the, any questions about the past programs and so on. And then uh, Master Lab, uh, they are getting the, our feedback in a little time and then updating the softwares and then having a real time discussion for the chemometric analysis. So, and thank you so much for your attention and thank you so much for your listening. Yep. Thank you very much, Hei Yang, for the uh, very nice presentation. And I mean, of course, it's very, I think, important to, to see and to establish a contribution of NMR in particular in the development phase. I mean, could you, could you comment on would this, do you expect to have a contribution of NMR there for during all the stages of, of development? So, uh, or, or this would be mostly during phase one or at least well, what could you sort of project potentially if this is established as a platform technique in development? Oh yeah. So basically we expect this one can, uh, NMR can contribute for the all the stage of the, of the development from the phase one through the uh, product. So basically phase one, before we do uh, any kind of uh, clinical trial start, we do need to prepare the IND uh, filing. So then uh, there also we need um, biophysical technology and biophysical information is needed. And then, and then phase two, phase three, we always need IND amendment. Uh, which is uh, for the uh, follow-up uh, filing stuff. So we also can contribute to NMR in there. Then once it goes to the uh, BLA stage after the phase three clinical trial, then uh, we can make a full package of the uh, NMR data or biophysical data, then contributing to the filing. 
And then once um, it's actually already is utilizing in terms of vaccine NMR, they are in, in they are using NMR as a release test. So which means any kind of a product is releasing and they need to run the 1D proton experiment and then make sure all the product quality is uh, uh, high enough and good enough and it, it is maintained. So we do see the NMR can contribute uh, for the or process of the uh, development stages. Yeah, thank you very nice. Um, so there are a number of questions. Uh, actually, maybe the first one from your collaborator, <laughs> which you mentioned on the slide, which is Donna uh, Valdiseri. Uh, so she has a very specific question, actually. So to choose how many scans are required for the 2D methyl fingerprint NIST recommended 40 to 1 in the first row of the HSQC of their FRAP fragment. Now the question comes, do you have a, a number for the signal to noise in the first row of an also fast HMQC for that purpose, especially for intact uh, an antibody monoclonal therapy? Uh, so, <laughs> Marcus, if I understood uh, Christian correctly, so she is asking about 1D and 2D separately. Or no, no, she just to wants see. to know for the first serial file, I guess, in the of the SOFAST HMQC, okay. what signal to noise you basically need then uh, yeah, for an intact, not yeah, for, yeah, yeah. for antibody fragment, but for intact antibody. Yeah, that, that's one thing that we are actually, um, <laughs> we are also working on it. So I do have the specific number, but I don't have it in my mind, but it is about 200 something. So basically we really have to get the uh, proper signal to noise of the first serial file that otherwise the, we found that PCA analysis going uh, very noisy and the data clustering is also kind of um, difficult. So mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that's that's really really good point. And uh, but th those kind of experiment also a design uh, planned because we wanted to see what is the minimum of the signal to noise to get the uh, proper chemometric analysis. So that's why we basically designed the uh, um, several different sets of the experiment. That one we already know which overly uh, nice 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 uh, spectrum then we know what is the signal noise of there. And then the other one, we know that one is giving very poor uh, chemometric analysis and the signal to noise is kind of low. So we basically set up the maximum and minimum. And then we wanted to actually explore what is the optimal. And <laughs> because we do not want to overkill, uh, overly measure the animal experiment because it usually takes 20 hours for the, each experiment. And then we have more than 10 samples so, so basically, we really need to find uh, what is the optimal things. But at the moment, we do recommend the signal to noise as about 200. But that effort is uh, continued to doing, and then uh, we will come up with the um, optimal uh, optimal signal to noise from the first serial file of the uh, this 2D experiment. Thank you. So, so there are actually two questions, which uh, one from Andy Bird and the other one from Charles uh, Tatirana. Uh, asking whether, I mean, this is natural abundance, uh, carbon HSQC, and is, this is really using the NIST, uh, the, the approach from the NIST group, and uh, yeah, how much time is required then for the measurements? Yeah, <laughs> so basically at the moment we are using as a 20 hours per each experiment, but we try to utilize the NUS and also try to reduce the time. So all those kind of um, uh, effort is uh, going on but but at the moment what we are estimating the time as at least 20 hours per each each, each experiment and um yeah and uh, we will see that, that there is a new first program called xl also fast hmqc we recently received from broker and um, they basically claim that that one is giving more than two times a higher the signal to noise so uh, sensitivity then we may be able to reduce the measurement time. So that is also uh, under investigating. Mm. Maybe one, uh, I mean, there are more questions, but uh, maybe one last question, uh, for, because two speakers, uh, two attendees basically wonder about artifacts. First of all, uh, what was your D1 delay uh, and, uh, in the also fast HMQC? And do you see any artifacts and more generally 
how much do artifacts in the spectra contribute to the overall analysis then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. So at the moment, we are using just one second as, um, as just the default recommended. So uh, we didn't really uh, explore as a so fast HMQC. So in terms of so fast HMQC PERS program, we do uh, explore the, through the 100, uh, 100, uh, 100 microsec to 200 microsec and every different D1. And then we try to see what kind of differences we can see. It. But in terms of also uh, fast HMQC, we just use the D1 as one second. And then uh, we basically follow the as, as, as default uh, recommendation of the parameters. But that is absolutely something that we also try to uh, reduced for the measurement time and then change the parameters. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, then hand over to uh, Bob Griffin to introduce our second speaker. Thank you, Bob. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, the second speaker is Lauren Andreas, um, who's presently uh, at the NPI in Göttingen. And Lauren started out as uh, career in science as an undergraduate at Oberlin College, where he got his BA in 2007. And while he was there, he was introduced to magnetic resonance by the very famous Manish Metra, who has uh, generated a lot of very important people uh, for graduate students in the United States. Then Lauren is one of them. He came to MIT in 2014 and uh, stayed for a few years and completed his PhD in 2014. And he did a, <clears throat> a very nice study at that time on the structure and function of Mahong's favorite molecule, influenza A, M2. And he looked at a construct of it, say M2, 18 to 60, uh, <clears throat> and actually did a structure in diphytonil PC. It was the uh, S31N mutant, and showed very interestingly that it had a different structure from what had been seen previously, and it was a dimer of dimer. Now, during that work, uh, he got involved in doing proton detected experiments and he made a few trips to Lyon uh, to work with Guido Pentacuda and liked it very much. So when he graduated in 2014, he moved to Lyon, um, <clears throat> sponsored by a Marie Curie Fellowship. And he spent a couple of years uh, postdocing with Guido. Also, I guess, working with Anne Lesage a little bit on DNP while he was there. And then in 2016, uh, he moved to his present uh, research position at the MPI in, in Göttingen. And he's presently an Emmy Neutra Fellow. He got an Emmy Neutra Fellowship in March of, of 2018. And in the course of all this work, well, in addition to this very nice structure uh, that I mentioned previously of the, the M218 to 60, uh, there were a couple of very nice, important papers that came out of the uh, his days in Lyon. One was a structure of uh, <clears throat> the virus particle AP205. And quite recently this year, uh, in 2020, he, he published a structure together with Guido of the alkyl membrane protein, which is a very interesting uh, structure. He's also um, generated a few new pulse sequences, uh, which everybody can use and needs. Uh, one of them is Rava Sasa. Maybe you can uh, correct the pronunciation of that. Uh, when uh, you get on the air here, uh, Lauren, it's, it stands for redundant assignment uh, <clears throat> if single simultaneous acquisition, be a sen sen um, single simultaneous acquisition. And more recently, he's perjured T-door into something called TreeDoor, which is transferred rotational echo double resonance, okay? And that's a very nice paper that just came out in JPCA uh, this year in 2021. And today he's going to tell us about a very interesting new topic, and that is detection of bound water molecules inside membrane protein pores. So Lauren, with that uh, introduction, minor introduction, uh, the, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Bob, for this very kind introduction. With the, with the pulse sequence you mentioned is a completely made up word, so you can pronounce it however you like. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> The, the tree door, we, we, we didn't mean to perjure uh, ourselves here or, or, uh, or plagiarize, but to give credit to um, development of T-door and Redor and using a similar nomenclature. So I hope that comes across. Let me share my screen. Yeah, so um, 
I thought I'd start off by way of motivation with some very general things. Of course, water is ubiquitous in um, biological systems. And uh, as such, it was even the topic of a recent national meeting. And it shows up uh, all the time in NMR spectroscopy. So for example, with water log C for detecting small molecules, binding to proteins. Um, early on in, in solution, um, it was shown um, that uh, detection of water interaction sites on proteins could be found and then even in the hydrophobic, more hydrophobic parts of the, of the protein, which didn't show up in crystal structures. And I think um, what's important to note at the beginning is, is also that the study of water is uh, quite challenging because it's also the solvent in biological systems. So characterizing uh, changes in the thermodynamics is difficult to separate from the solvent. You can't just titrate a single water molecule into a system the way that you, you can into others. And of course, the entropy and enthalpy of water both are, are extremely important, is well known um, in, in the hydrophobic effect and the hydrogen bonding capabilities of water. And in uh, solid state NMR, there is also quite an interest in mapping uh, water interaction in proteins. Here's a selection of some of those studies. Uh, for example, looking behind a selectivity filter uh, in a membrane protein, um, some, some of our own work with membrane proteins to map the surface where water uh, interacts. And Mei Hong also recently published that uh, water inside of the influenza B pore is anisotropic, so it's not um, well, it's oriented inside, inside that channel. And she also published inter interactions with, with fibrils that uh, the water chemical shifts change slightly. Um, there's also earlier work in crystals, for example, by Buckman and, and Lesage and other examples. Um, the common feature for the vast majority of these studies is that the water resonance is found very close to 4.8 ppm. And there's some very nice language in one of the earlier papers that is quoted here. Um, and I won't read it all out, but basically it says we can anticipate that um, chemical shifts of protein-bound water molecules are influenced by the environment, so we'd expect different chemical shifts. Um, but as a rule, the proton resonances of the protein hydration water and aqueous solution are the same uh, as bulk water. And so from this, we conclude that there's exchange of protons with hydration water with the, between hydration water and bulk water, which averages out the differences in chemical shifts. Um, and this is what we see also in the solid state, uh, although it's slightly different from, from bulk water in that case because uh, water associated to membranes, for example, or, or in between crystal lattices is slightly different from the bulk. Um, as with any good rule, there's some exceptions. Uh, for example, I came across uh, hydroxyl protons. Of, well, I, I didn't mention, so this is also true for side chains um, listed here as serine threonine, et cetera, in most cases, but um, the group of Rife and, and this paper from Agarval very nicely showed um, an exception to this rule in the hydroxyl protein of uh, threonine 24 that you see here. Um, there are also examples in crystals in much more rigid lattices um, where the water proton chemical shift can be detected. Um, and so I decided to uh, show you the answer or the conclusions the concluding slide right at the beginning and then circle around to the introduction about the system that we're studying. Um, so on the left here you see a nitrogen proton correlation spectrum um, from influenza M2 and uh, this is recorded with long cross-polarization time of three to six milliseconds and in three to six milliseconds it's possible then to see a bound chemical shift of water at 11 ppm here and we noticed this initially because of the exquisite resolution that we can get with proton detected spectra when we go to its highest fields we can and the fastest spinning we can. Um, this is slightly different in chemical shift compared to these uh, peaks here that come from uh, tryptophan. Um, and here you see the slice taken out. It's not particularly, um, well, it's, it's fairly noisy. And that's mainly because this peak uh, exchanges within a few milliseconds to the normal associated water um, peak that we see. Um, we did some filtering experiments which I will describe later. So these data come from the influenza A M2 protein which you see depicted here uh, in a schematic of, a, of the virus particle. Um, this is 
as Bob mentioned in the introduction, a protein that's been studied by, by many labs. Um, it's a tetrameric protein, and it's, it's a, quite a minimalistic example of a proton channel, which is then appealing to study by a variety of techniques. Um, and that is its, its main role is to conduct protons in endosomes, acidifying a virus interior, in interior and uh, allowing release of the genetic material of the virus. Uh, it may also be important in, in changing pH gradients across uh, other organelles like the Golgi. Um, and Tim Cross had proposed uh, all the way back in, in, two, in a 2006 paper that the key to tuning the pH sensitivity of this proton con conducting channel may be because of a particular structure at histidine residues. So the histidine and tryptophan in this protein are almost perfectly conserved. And uh, he proposed that there might be uh, NH and hydrogen bond in the system, which would necessarily break the symmetry. Uh, and he proposed that uh, there would be non-conducting states which either uh, lack a, the hydrogen bond or, or contain this hydrogen bond, and then conducting states when uh, a third proton enters the channel. And this is largely um, understood to be um, correct that it's the third proton which then results in, in conduction. Um, but it was important to follow up and get really definitive proof for this hydrogen bonding arrangement because uh, in crystal structures, this NHN hydrogen bond among the histidine side chains uh, essentially never shows up. So this shows two examples, one in complex with uh, a drug candidate type of molecule. Uh, and you see the histidine is either very far apart uh, or they form this kind of box arrangement in crystal structures. And some of these crystal structures, I, I should mention, are, are exquisite resolution, resolving water. Um, there's XFEL data and there's lipid cubic phase data. Um, and, and this slide shows even a few more of these, um, as well as Tim Cross's structure, um, which is the only one here showing this uh, NHN type of hydrogen bond arrangement, arrangement. Tim Cross's structure comes from a mainly oriented sample um, NMR showing the tilt angle of these, uh, of these helices and then adding in the information about the NHN hydrogen bonding. And so as Bob mentioned before, we had seen that there is a, a dimer of dimers. So this is consistent with uh, Tim's uh, model, but we didn't have direct proof at the time that we had this hydrogen bonding arrangement. Here you can see there's only one proline in the sequence of our construct, but we have two, res uh, two, two peaks showing up for proline 25. So um, recently, last year, we, we could uh, show that there really is a hydrogen bond interaction here by measuring a J coupling. And this shows that data. So uh, we could have the following dimer of dimers model for the active residue, the key functional residue histidine here uh, at high pH, pH 7.8. So there's no charge in this system. Um, and then, uh, just mapping out the uh, increasing the, the tau delay, we could then measure the J coupling to uh, 8.9 hertz. So we could tell then that this is a uh, normal hydrogen bond, not, uh, not a low barrier hydrogen bond um, based on that J coupling value. Uh, Tim Cross did some very similar work at lower pH and with the full length construct of M2 and came to similar conclusions. Here at lower pH, the spectroscopy gets much more challenging. Um, they used echo type of spectra. Uh, the papers came out in similar timing. Um, and we, we always get asked uh, whether we have tau, tau or pi tautomers of histidine. So we uh, measured that very carefully um, by starting with the proton signal from a uh, carbon attached proton um, in this red spectrum here, going H to C to N and all the way back. Uh, and that means that we have uh, one nitrogen, which will be uh, the epsilon, which will be correlated to two different carbon attached protons, and we have another nitrogen, the delta one, which we correlated to only one. Um, with this, we could tell that both of these are in the tau uh, tautomer state. So we can continue now building our model uh, of the hydrogen bonded arrangement of these histidines um, to include uh, tau A, a tau B, hydrogen bonded with NHN, and then based on this, this water chemical shift, uh, also likely a hydrogen bond to 
uh, a water molecule for this uh, open available nitrogen delta one. Um, so all of this is, is, is very interesting to note that then upon addition of the drug, this hydrogen bonding arrangement uh, completely disappears. And we have this dramatic change in chemical shift from this four, above 14 ppm down to about eight. Um, and so we think that these are really functionally relevant structures because they're broken by the, by the drug. And so understanding the, the influence of this water molecule should help us uh, tune and understand uh, the, the details of this um, process. Uh, also to note that uh, Mei Hong had seen in a, in a shorter construct, a transmembrane construct, also very large chemical shift changes, but um, these in the side chain of histidine are really particularly dramatic. And uh, based on the knowledge uh, of the binding location of the drug, we can tell this is not a direct effect of drug binding. Um, this shows our DMP-derived structural model um, and Mei Hong has come to similar, the same conclusion before us in her, in her nature paper that the drug binds here uh, in, in contact with the valine 27 towards the end terminus of the protein. Um, so it's not too far away from the histidines, but uh, there's a water network in between. So with this, we can speculate that this binding now is uh, potentially ordering the N-terminal side, but um, based on the dynamic and exchanging histidine peaks that we see causing a, a disordering of the, of the histidine. So we, there should be a, an entropic gain as that water and these histidines become more mobile towards the, the C-terminus of the, of the protein upon um, binding. I also wanted to mention before that, but, that these um, molecules, these adamantane, amino adamantane molecules, there's two of them that are, are licensed for use or were licensed for use for previous variants that were circulating. These are the only examples of um, viroporin blockers that, channel blockers that have really made it to market. Um, and I think, well, in the context of the, of the recent pandemic and coming up with additional inhibitors for other viroporins will be something to look at um, for the future. So coming back to the earlier slide, um, in long CP, we see this uh, peak showing up at 11 ppm. And then to really um, show that this was uh, water or at least not attached to nitrogen or, or carbon, we did a dipolar filtered experiment. And you can see that the backbone nitrogen's intensity decays right away because of the attached proton. Um, the associated water, which is much more dynamic, essentially retains full intensity and our peak at 11 ppm drops only slightly. So this is further support that, um, that this is a water molecule. Um, but um, based on hydrate crystals, it's known that the, the water molecule flips with, in, in most cases, with energy barriers of 20 or 30 kilojoules per mole or so. Um, so there's also the possibility that we were observing an average chemical shift among both protons of the water. Um, and to try to get some insight into this, we then recorded DNP spectra. So I'm introduced by Bob, I should at least show a DNP spectrum. Um, so this was recorded with a Phoenix NMR probe, which can spin up to 24 kilohertz. And here the, the proton chemical shifts become um, just well enough to resolve to see um, a proton detected spectrum. So this shows the side chain peaks in the same place for the histidine um, side chain peaks. And we can see the same peak for water is showing up at almost the same PPM at around 11. Um, if we do the same kind of dipolar filtering, this uh, cleans up the, the spectrum a little bit more and we can really see this peak. So we think that not only the single water molecule that we're observing, but it's probably a single proton that we're observing from a single water molecule. Um, and to further back this up, then we did some DFT chemical shift um, calculations. And the predicted shifts for so these kind of hydrogen bonded arrangements where we include these two histidines and also a water molecule, depending on how it converged, this water molecule you can see is in a bit different um, orientation. We got either 10.6 ppm or 8.5 ppm. Um, and 
the, we should also, also from the DFT, we could tell that the um, deprotonated nitrogen shift just it fits much better to our data when we have a hydrogen bond uh, partner there. So this further supports that the, the water molecules are hydrogen bonded. Um, so in conclusion, um, this is our um, working model for the hydrogen bond arrangement that we have in these samples. We have a, detected by J coupling, the NHN interaction, and then by a long CP interaction between a water molecule and um, proton, uh, uh, sorry, the nitrogen of the histidine 37. Um, this uh, conclusion that water is a hydrogen bonding partner for histidine 37, something that May had also uh, measured earlier and concluded that histidine is a, a hydrogen bonding partner. Um, but this uh, chemical shift, this really unique chemical shift at 11 ppm is what is new here. Um, and in the remaining time, I wanted to just mention very briefly some of the other topics. So we recently um, published a structure of ALK-L from Pseudomonas petia, where we could try to understand the um, process of, of uh, diffusion of hydrophobic molecules through the lipopolysaccharide layer. Uh, and key to this study was uh, dynamics measurements and chemical shift perturbations and molecular dy dynamics. Uh, which I won't have time to go into detail, um, but just wanted to put it here as an example of what we can do with proton detected spectroscopy for structure determination, um, which in this case turned out to be quite important because when we go to the lipid bilayer um, membranes, we see a completely different structure for the uh, outer loop parts of the protein as compared with um, the case in the detergents that we could use for solution NMR. Um, this shows the uh, NH spectrum of this protein when it, without deuteration, spinning fast at 100 kilohertz and some of the, the um, rest restraint statistics for our structure. And uh, these, these spectra, they continue getting much, much more resolved as we go up in field. Um, this shows the comparison for M2 at uh, 1.2 gigahertz and the 950 megahertz. Um, and you can appreciate this dramatic improvement in the ability to really separate peaks in two or three dimensions. And we went through and carefully analyzed the half widths of these peaks and find for proton we get uh, improvement which is better than the ratio of fields. And for nitrogen or carbon it, it scales with the ratio of fields. Uh, of course, measuring the peak in ppm, since in ppm, uh, this is what defines our resolution. Um, for 3D or 4D spectroscopy, this means we'd expect about a factor of 2 or a factor of uh, even 2.5 for the number of peaks that can be resolved. Um, another example is this is a membrane protein SIT-A, uh, collaboration with Christian Griesinger. And this, in this case, showing the CH spectrum, and you can appreciate the, the much higher quality of these CH correlation spectra, which will become important for uh, molecules of this size uh, getting up into the range of 30 kilodalton or even a little bit above. Um, one final example with VDAC uh, showing similar gains in resolution um, for both the NH and CH spectra when we go through and carefully measure the peaks at half height. Um, and with that, I um, would like to thank uh, a whole group of people. Um, the work on M2 is primarily uh, Kumar's work and he's just um, graduated recently and left for um, a postdoc uh, in Delaware with Tatiana Polinova. Um, Kai Sue also was involved with the M2 and is in taking over Part of that proje project. Uh, Riza did the, uh, kicked off at least the uh, um, structure calculations, the DFT um, and chemical shift calculations, and uh, other members of the group were involved in other of their pieces shown briefly at the end, the membrane proteins. Um, the Alcal was together with, with Guido and uh, Tobias um, from Lyon, um, Stefan Becker and Karen Giller are expressing protein in the lab here. And I also wanted to mention uh, Vladimir Galiv, who is always supplying us with uh, our deuterated 
uh, deuterated molecules for this. So mainly, um, um, mainly um, lipids, but uh, in some cases also deuterated detergents, which help us uh, avoid problems with T1 noise in the proton detected uh, spectra. And thanks very much. I'd be happy to take questions. Okay, <clears throat> Lauren, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, so uh, I'll get um, some, uh, uh, I'll ask one question uh, that maybe get people some time to type things in. So a long time ago, we actually looked at some proton spectra of small molecules. And <clears throat> we never saw a water molecule. I mean, it's like oxalic acid dihydrate and things like this. And you, you see exchange in solid state spectra between the water and say the OH group and the, and the oxalic acid. But the water, uh, which is hydrogen bonded there, never moves very far downfield. It goes, you know, maybe five or six, five and a half ppm, something. I don't remember the exact uh, chemical shift value. I can look it up. But what we did see was that the <clears throat> OH proton was actually shifted down to about, I think it was, I think it was about 14 or 15 ppm. Mm -hmm. So are you really looking, the question is, are you really looking at a water molecule or one or a proton that's just seriously hydrogen bonded uh, to some partner? And it's not really water anymore, but it's, you know, something in between water and a hydrogen bonded partner. I mean, how do you tell the difference between that, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a good point. I mean, the, um, as you mentioned, the chemical shift is strongly correlated with the strength of the hydrogen bond and how, how, pull, how stretched and pulled that proton is away from um, its bonded molecule, in this case, the oxygen. Um, so I think it does indicate a, a fairly strong interaction there, but um, the DFT is consistent with it being a fairly normal hydrogen bond. I mean, it's not, it's not like the hydrogen bond is equally shared in that interaction in the DFT. If I could follow up on that, can you say a few more words about the DFT calculation? How, was, how are the geometries optimized? How, what was included in the model? Um, yeah, so we basically took the, um, the region of the tetramer from... Um, from the isoleucine 33 um, uh, down through 37 and also included the tryptophan so that we would have a good representation of that, um, th th that region. Um, there's just quite a lot of atoms for DFT, so these took quite a long time to complete. Um, and then we started at lower levels of theory and then um, we eventually uh, worked our way up to the B3 lip um, the this, this standard um, or uh, the standard functionals which are used for um, for chemical shift um, calculation. I'd have to ask Riza for more details beyond that because he's done the, the calculations. I have one answer to Bob's question might be how much partial charge there was on the water oxygen. So yeah, so here you can see um, part of that geometry. Um, which doesn't really show it here, but um, so we, we included the tetramer for the geometry optimization step. And in some cases, we selected only the dimer for chemical shift determination because these, um, these took quite a long time. I haven't looked at partial charges to see uh, what those are. Um, something we can we can have a look at, but it's the B three lip six three one one star star DP. If you want to know the the function, yeah. So um, experimentally, to answer Bob's question, experimentally, my group has done carbon and nitrogen double dephasing of uh, the proton signal to prove that if you have an HOH, that that H signal won't be affected by these carbon nitrogen pulses. So that's how we sort out whether it could be an NH group or, or OH group, so. 
So we, we published that. I mean, it's low sensitivity, but that's, we, uh, we did that, of course, without any uh, fast MAS or, you know, uh, high field at the time. It was about around 2012, maybe we did try that. It's double read or dephasing works, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our, our filter was just cross-polarization. Um, we, at the fast spinning, it's uh, harder to apply read or pulses on nitrogen channel. On, on the nitrogen channel because we can't meet the recoupling condition very easily. Okay, so let's <clears throat> go to the other questions. Uh, why do you get such a wide range uh, from the DFT calculations? Maybe you have already answered that, but uh, maybe you want to address it again if you haven't, don't think you have really. Well, sure. Um, we, we basically have two examples and they converge to different structures. So the water was allowed to move during the geometry optimization step. Um, and I mean, water can move quite a lot in these. Um, so we just ended up with two different cases. Um, the one that matches better um, also satisfies an additional hydrogen bond to the oxygen. And the one that matches worse um, is missing a hydrogen bond to the oxygen um, that might you know, pro provide some information, but we didn't want to conclude too much about that. Okay, Walt has a question. Uh, if you change the pH from the starting protein solution, do you see a change in the bound water chemical shift or bound water occupancy? Yeah, good question. So unfortunately, um, when we lower the pH, we start to get multiple species and the charged species for, for this protein construct um, become quite broad. So we're fairly limited at room temperature um, with these high resolution data, we're fairly limited in which pHs we can access. Um, but I think that could be something quite interesting to follow up uh, at lower temperature where we can be more confident that what we're seeing in peak intensity wise is a better uh, correlation to um, to the different species that are there. So the, the charged and more mobile species, um, Tim Cross has also pointed this out, that the charged and more mobile species, they're just, they're, they, they're not as sensitive in the spectra at room temperature. Okay, so uh, Zihu Sun uh, says, great talk. I wonder if you have tried to quantitatively measure the distance between small molecules and backbone or side chain atoms with say BAS, SD, or SERP, or any other one of the proton detected sequences? Yeah, so for this particular case, we know the, the atomental cage is rotating fast. Um, so a lot of these um, techniques are, um, are, are a bit, um, let's say the, the, the dipole coupling gets scaled down. Uh, but May has done a lot of that, so we didn't think there was a need to, to, to follow up too much there. So she's deuterated the, the a very similar um, drug molecule in amantadine and seen um, with mostly with Redor um, the distances there. What we did do is with uh, DNP, we, uh, we had an N15 labeled molecule and we looked at the distances from the, uh, the N15 to the protein to, uh, to find that binding site. So Umit's <clears throat> question is maybe I missed uh, this point during the talk, but would detecting hydrogen bonds in a protonated protein non-deuterated at 100 plus kilohertz and high fields be possible? Or do we still need the deuteration for such measurements? Uh, yeah, so I didn't mention explicitly, but um, I think every, every spectrum I showed today was from a protonated sample. There's no deuteration um, in any of it. Um, so that includes the alkyl spectrum that I that I showed there. Um, it might be easier. So if the proton shift is not so strongly uh, moved towards 11 ppm, if it shows up more overlapping with, say, the alpha region around 5 ppm, um, then we might want to deuterate to to more easily find that proton. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and Grace. Uh, ask what must be the exchange rate to observe these water molecules? How slowly do they have to, to exchange? So they, they have to be slow enough to um, persist through the cross polarization step. So we, we have the signal on nitrogen until the very last, uh, the last step in the pulse program, uh, pulse sequence is that cross polarization step. 
Um, and because it's fairly far from the nitrogen, uh, this takes three to six milliseconds before we can build up a reasonable signal. Um, but it's all, it's all a trade-off between signal-to-noise and time. So you know, if we had more time, we could try one millisecond and eventually see a peak. Um, but basically, this means that room temperature, the exchange rate is slower than um, in milliseconds. Yeah. So Tim Cross uh, <clears throat> says, very nice talk. Uh, do you think uh, it is the interaction between the histidines that drives the formation of the dimer, a dimer structure, as opposed to a fourfold symmetric structure? Yeah, also a good question, always from Tim. Um, it seems to be um, a part of it, but not all of it. So we still see a dimer of dimers when the drug is bound and that, that hydrogen bond interaction is broken. Um, but a lot of the peaks move closer together. So um, my speculation is that what's driving it is the bulky tryptophan residues, which are difficult to pack in a tight space in a perfectly symmetric arrangement. Okay, and the final question is, can this be done by solution in MR? Um, I don't know. Actually, that's a question I would like to ask the audience, um, is if there are cases um, in solution where this type of thing has been done, because I've searched a lot of literature and um, despite a lot of keywords coming up because there's so many studies involving water, um, it's difficult to filter ones where the chemical shift was really distinct. So, so, so for example, um, the, regarding to this, Lauren, like yeah. Bertie, Halle, Bertie Halle has a nice methodology that, that the measure relaxation of water and also he has some uh, deuteration, I mean, deuterium uh, relaxation measurement, relaxation dispersion, that he can monitor slow uh, mole water molecules bound to the surface. Like, and, and then, if, if you know, the, the, I mean, in principle, he can even pinpoint the location on them. In, by, by solution. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so the localization of water, I'm familiar with the, the, a lot of work um, lo localizing water. Um, of course, in there you, you measure the bulk water properties, but if there was, uh, because you, you measured uh, like with the, the resolution of that, but, but I guess that you cannot work with a system in, in, in solution, or, or if you can. If you, if you had the resolution with the, with the GSPC, in principle, you, you could use the, the Bertil Palace uh, methodology. Because but so you, would, would that methodology give you the chemical shift? With well, the, you, you would monitor the, the imidazole ring there, like, uh, and then look at the, the, the water molecule that would be, so, so measuring there the interaction that you have with these relaxation dispersion from there. So, so, from, so, so from the relaxation dispersion profile, then you would calculate the, the that, shift? That, that, that's how he does. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's one further question popped up here. Could you comment? Uh, it's from Himenshu and uh, could you comment on the residence time of the bound water? And what about other, pro what about other proton shifts? I'm not sure. So the residence time, I think I, um, I answered a bit with the, we don't have a precise measurement. The, the specs are a bit noisy to do a fit for the exchange to the associated water peak. Um, but it's, you know, it's in the order of a few milliseconds, milliseconds. Um, I'm not sure what the other question refers to, which shifts. Yeah. Um, oh, so, sorry. So, so one, one thing you didn't say was the lipid, you have the M2 in, and that was probably diphytonyl PC or POPC or? Yeah, we use diphytonyl PC for these um, because we get the sharpest spectra there. Um, but we've also used um, maize magic mixture of viral membrane lipids and we still see the, the hydrogen bond peaks in that mixture with this construct. So I think it's probably more to do with the construct than the lipids. So the construct was what exactly? Was it 18 to 60 or? Yes, it's the same 18 to 60. Um, so that also implies that it's not entirely the, the tryptophan residues which are causing this, this dimer of dimer structure, but has some, to some degree, it's also this amphipathic helix, which um, which drives that. So can I follow up? Uh, so do you still see two sets of chemical shifts in that, in that um, virus mimetic membrane? Yes. Identical yeah. to your DPHPC? That's surprising because we, we never saw that. It was... Uh, well, the peaks become a little bit broader um, in the mixture, but let me show the... 
Uh, I've got to share the screen again. Um, does it go to the right place? So here you can see the, the viral membrane taking your composition. And we, we see these two characteristic peaks, um, diphytonyl PC and uh, DHPC with, uh, diphytonyl PC with cholesterol as well. We still see these two characteristic uh, shifts. It's really most obvious on the, on the histidines because this is such a large separation. Mm -hmm. So we should compare notes about um, your construct, I think. That's because we have made something very similar. Tim Cross has done something similar. So this is very, this is surprising to me. I thought it was a combination of, you know, the, the lipid you use and the construct. But, um, so, yeah, because DPHPC is so special, right? It has such a uh, strong negative curvature because of the methyl groups on the lipid chains. Well, it is, it is special and it's um, also Bob liked it because we could get it with uh, uh, ether linkage instead of ester linkage. So it's a very stable lipid. Um, but also in those papers, the initial papers with Bob, um, we saw identical chemical shifts with POPC and with um, diphytonyl PC. Um, of course, every lipid is special in different ways. Um, but this um, POPC. Yeah. Although there were some things, I mean, that that diphytonyl PC had some properties. For example, VDAC uh, was folded properly in, in diphytonyl PC, whereas in the other, in the carbonyl label lipid, in the carbonyl lipids, it, it wasn't. I forgot what, which which one it was, but uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, how could I forget? It doesn't have a phase transit transition, right? The most important thing as well. It doesn't have a low temperature. Uh, alpha beta phase transition, right? And there's no pre-transition. Right. Um, and it's, of course, the lipid that bacteria redopsin lives in, the type of lipid that, that BR lives in, and it's an ether-linked lipid and it is very stable. So you don't have to worry about hydrolysis of the SN2 chain. Yeah, so it, yeah. But I mean, um, beta barrel proteins and the seven transmembrane helix proteins are both more structurally robust than single transmembrane helix oligomeric assemblies. So I think it's just they're less prone to be distorted by the environment, membrane environment. So I think one has yeah, to- Yeah, I agree, especially with these, with the beta barrels, they're really, yeah. really robust against um, different lipids. Mm 